So in nature, butterflies are some of the most familiar natural delights that we can see. We all just love watching butterflies and of course discovering new ones. This is often accidental and unplanned, it just happens. This talk is about giving you the best chances at home, on your dog walk, or a field trip, or when you're on holiday. Now the British, we are a little bit obsessed with butterflies. But when you but ask your question, what have butterflies ever done for us? That's as per Monty Python, if you remember. And I'm just going to run the presentation. Here's a good example of what moths have done for us. Let's choose something topical and local. This is a vaccine produced by a moth. It's the Novavax vaccine produced in Billium by Fujifilm. At the current time, there's 300 people working 24 hours a day to produce 60 million doses of this moth vaccine. And it's a fascinating story of how you've, we've harnessed nature to fight uh, the pandemic. Uh, it should be approved in the next couple of weeks. And I think it's a really cracking example of how people have exploited moths. David Asbra talks about butterflies as a canary down in the mine and our best indicator of the health of the, of the world. I particularly feel privileged to be what's known as a transect walker. I walk a fixed route every week, I count butterflies. I get to go to some of the most beautiful places, count the flying jewels of the natural world in glorious weather at the best time of the year. Actually, there's a lot more to it than just that, although that should be enough for most people. It's also a great therapy, an antidote for our modern digital world. When I'm walking, something really happens. My senses go into overdrive. I've become part of nature. It absorbs you. It, it's a, a very satisfying experience. But while I'm doing this, you also recording what you're seeing. That provides data, hard data, science on climate change and conservation and very soon this data will be used to manage much more closely the, the how our land is managed in the future under a new scheme the, the government calls the elm scheme which is the new environmental land management scheme um, and we will be one of the key measures in, in accessing, assessing biodiversity and what's known as natural capital in other words, are you using up natural resources, not paying back to nature? And have we learned of such a valuable lesson during the pandemic of what happens when we go against nature? She fights back. I'm very keen to see every business will soon be asked to provide as part of their statu statutory financial responsibility, a natural capital balance sheet. Let's speed the day. So you could call this talk the when, the what, the where, and the how. When can we see butterflies? What might we see? Where might we see them? And how do we go about finding them? So we've taken the survey. Thank you very much for all this response. Catherine is busy. Uh, analyze them now and um, she'll get the chance to give us the results uh, when I finish the introduction which will be in a couple of minutes Catherine. Working on it. <laughs> Thank you. So it's a short but you'll be glad to hear it's a very short presentation that I'm going to give. Um, we don't want to kill you with 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 PowerPoint. Uh, it'd be fast but it will, and intense but it will be short. Um, and then we're going to do a 10 minute tutorial and we're going to look at all the web resources which are out there, particularly the Yorkshire Butterfly Conservation website and all the tools that are available that you can use to discover the whens, the whats, the wheres and the hows. And then we're going to take one of your locations that you put in the uh, survey and we're going to analyse it down and have a look at all the locations around that site. So be ready. If it's your location, be ready. Um, 
then I've put aside 20 minutes of questions. So loads of time, I hope loads of time for you to ask questions. So I think we need the interaction. And then I'm gonna sum up and put in some of our branch objectives in what I've talked about. So please stay muted. And when we, right, let's go on to when. This is the funny looking diagram. I'll explain what it means. Butterfly lives are generally very short, just a few days. But they fly, a generation flies over a period maybe of two to three weeks. Some species are very short. Some are considerably longer and fly over a longer period of two to three months. Others survive much longer by what's called estivating, which is a kind of hibernation but it's not just they can, can do it during the winter, but they can also do it during the summer. So for example, the peacock will disappear in the autumn. It's not died, it's estivating through the hottest parts of the summer, and then will often reemerge for short periods in the autumn, but then properly reemerge as one of the earliest butterflies in the spring. So a number of our garden species have this long life. It's almost 11 months long. So they only spend a very short period as a caterpillar in midsummer. So the peacock and the brimstone, um, which often appear in early spring, um, are literally, well, the females are still virgins when they appear and they've been virgins for nearly nine months. Those early, early species are then followed by species which have overwintered as a, as a chrysalis. That's the pupil stage. And things like the holly blue are, are some of the first to appear, followed by the speckled wood and the orange tip. And where this diagram comes in is it shows you the flight period. Um, and the dark color is the main flight period. So you'll see here the small tortoiseshell, you're for, probably familiar with the brimstone the peacock, the comma. We call those the venescids. They're all closely related. They all hibernate. So next in Yorkshire come the very early spring species. And the green hair streak is one of the first that appears, um, a, a quite a scarce species. And then a rare species, the dingy skipper. And I noticed today our very rarest butterfly in Yorkshire appeared today. And that's this one, the Duke of Burgundy. And you notice here that its flight period is very short, like about a week, and can occur in any weeks from the beginning of May. It's, a, it's appeared early this year, so the last few days of April as are many species now are beginning to appear early because of the amount of sunshine that, we, that we've enjoyed these last few weeks. Never mind the cold, they also respond to the sunshine. I'm not going to go on about all our different species. I'll leave you with this, this uh, flight diagram because this is about discovery and I want to show you some wonderful books what I'm reading at the moment is this one. I don't know if you can see it. I think my uh, computer is going to try and cut it out. It's uh, called, called, called there. If I put it in front of my gob, it'll show up. It's called Butterflies, about halfway through. It's an absolutely wonderful book that uh, goes through all the lives and, of butterflies. I also have this one. Uh, they're both published. It's called Life Cycles of, of British Butterflies. They're both published in the last few months and are really are classics of their time and well worth purchasing. So emergence depends on a number of factors. And a key one of this is obviously the temperature. And things are changing, you may have noticed. I like this picture. Um, 
I don't believe in global warming. <laughs> um, butterflies in general, their emergence is becoming earlier. And if you look on average, butterflies now over the last 20 years are emerging seven to 10, 10 days earlier than they have in the past. And there's also a seasonal weather factor. So to find the right time to go and see a butterfly, you do need information. So the classic way to, to, to find out is go and have a look on the Yorkshire Butterfly website or go to Facebook. Um, both are excellent sources of what's happening. And I'll show you later, we have a sightings page and I'll show you how it works. So just let's consider more about when we expect to see butterflies and the kind of conditions they will appear in. So obviously their temperature, they're very much daytime depending um, and you won't see a butterfly before 10.30 and usually by 3.30 they're gone, apart from of course the warm summer days. And of course they need a minimum temperature. So 13 degrees provided it's sunny, but if it's not sunny, more like 17 and by 20, de 20 degrees centigrade great, it doesn't really matter but when it gets to near 30 they actually will stop and rest and disappear if you're a photographer the best time for flight is not always the best time for doing photography because of course if they're super active they never stay still and of course your time is wasted so a warm over, an overcast day or a cool day with short sunny intervals is often best. If it's anywhere near 20 degrees centigrade, it gets difficult being a photographer. As I said before, planning, planning and the weather forecasts are crucial in order to see butterflies. So if you're planning a trip somewhere, you must really check your forecasts and plan, a, plan ahead a few days. Pick your site, which we're going to cover in some de details. Pack a pair of binoculars, a drink, and of course, don't forget the DEET for the ticks. Ticks are a bit of an occupational hazard when you're walking through long grass these days. Then I would ask you to think like a butterfly. Follow the flowers. Seek warm shelter. Avoid the wind. Don't leave it too late. Too late in the day to go go looking and take a obviously an identification guide and don't forget our day flying moss there's more day flying moss than there are day flying butterflies in the uk and they are really quite pretty some of them so record what you see if you see something please i make an appeal put it on the the yorkshire Butterfly Conservation sighting page. It not only shares it with everybody, but it also makes it into an official scientific record. And that is valuable. It's much better there than on Facebook because it will never count as a record. So what species do we have? Well, we have in Yorkshire, we have 38 species, but the numbers are rising. So in very recent past, uh, 2018 stroke 2019, we had a brand new species arrive. I was very lucky to be one of the first ones to see it. And that's this one here. It's called the silver wash fritillary. Um, and it arrived in 2017 and began to breed in 2018. And then it kind of invaded the whole of the county during 2019. But other, other species are spreading into Yorkshire. So since the 90s, this species, the marble white, has spread through almost the whole county. Brimstones have really reached nearly the northern edge in, of Yorkshire now. The gatekeeper has spread very much through Yorkshire. This little chap called the Essex Skipper. And you might note that what makes him an Essex Skipper is he has black tips on his antennae looks like a small skipper but it's a different species it's an Essex skipper and this species which in my childhood was a very uncommon species the speckled wood is now very common in fields and damp places um, 
and shady areas. Is it good? Oh, I forgot to bring your camera on. Um, okay. So let's look at the garden species first. I've talked about the Vanessids, that's the comma, the painted lady here, and the peacock and the red admiral. Of course, don't forget the small tortoiseshell. Um, and they're very common in our gardens, not forgetting, of course, the whites, that's the large white and the brimstone. And of course, the orange tip, which you see at the moment is, is well known in, in gardens. The Vanessids are quite strongly migrants, as are probably, you could say, nearly half our species on occasion can be migrants. They can migrate long distances and the painted, la painted lady is a classic one. It's known for its very long migrations. Um, they can fly up to about 200 kilometers during the course of one night, doing around about 30 or 40 miles an hour. They have compasses, they know the way, they have an excellent sense of smell. And it's difficult to believe that an insect that weighs just one gram can cover nearly 2,000 kilometers on occasion in its very short life. It's important when we, we, we realize what we see in our gardens is probably unlikely that they're actually living in your garden. So what you see is basically our gardens are pit stops. Basically they're on their way to somewhere else. And in many ways, our buddleia bushes, which you know, the butterfly bush, where a lot of these species will, will congregate, you could just think where those insects have come from. And I always think of the, the arrivals hall at Heathrow Airport, where lots of different nations all come. And it's highly likely that some of those insects on your buddleia, and probably 10% or more, have come from Spain, from France, and further afield. And um, it's always worth remembering the wonder that you're looking at when you're looking at just a simple thing like butterflies on your, on your buddy bush. Where have they come from? The brimstone here is a great wanderer. It spends a lot of time wandering through our gardens up and down hedgerows. Uh, it has to because its its food plant, is buckthorn, is so widely distributed. Uh, it has to spend time searching. When you find that uh, things like the the, the vanessids and the brimstone, as they disappear, as the season ends, and you think, where have they gone? Don't assume that they've died. Um, a lot of them will make their way to the hibernation sites. And quite often those sites will be woodlands and not only your shed, your garden shed, but also woodlands in the surrounding areas. And I'm always staggered as I do my transect and walk through woodland, how many uh, of the species are overwintering. So I'm, I'm not uncommon that I'll see 20 or 30 brimstones nectaring in, in late October in the wood. Um, as they prepare for the winter hibernation. So going from our gardens to the next kind of habitat where you'll find lots of butterflies. And um, the grasslands, of course, are key areas for, for our species. And we have four families that inhabit them. The browns, so the meadow brown, the ringlet, and the uh, wall butterfly, which is this one here, which has now become was very common uh, up till probably 15 years ago, around about um, 20, 2006, 2007, um, they became quite scarce and now are restricted to the coast. This is a small copper butterfly. This is the large skipper and this is the marble white. And of course, we all recognize the common blue. When we see these butterflies, 
um, then we know we're on, on a good area of grassland. And it's important to remember that we've lost nearly 97% of our tradi traditional meadows. And um, that's since World War II. And the sites that remain are really our important sites. Many of them are Yorkshire Wildlife Trust sites. There's still many others in forgotten corners or recently created like motorway embankments and other areas, brownfield sites, which are critically important for the survival of our species. Most of our grassland species need uh, a sward which is, which is thin, uh, flowery, and the right species of gra grasses growing in order to survive and any kind of mowing disrupts them. So many of the surviving sites are steeply sloping. So places where tractors couldn't go. So they've never been, never been fertilized. They've never been plowed during World War II. And they're quite often the surviving areas for many of our species. Then we go on to our more specialists and arboreal species. So these are the woodland, the woodland type species. So I mentioned the silver wash fritillary, a new arrival. There's a couple of species I'd like to mention, um, some special species, the hair streaks. And here we have the white letter hair streak named after the letter on its hind wing here. And this is the purple hair streak, which inhabits oak trees. And there are, they're, they're not uncommon but very rarely reported because of the habit of living around tops of trees. And of course, you need to know which trees to look at. So if I can give you some tips tonight, the places to see the purple hair streak is well illuminated. So at least three sides, oak trees, doesn't matter particularly where they are. Um, and go and have a look towards the later, latter end of the day when they become active. And they don't like heat, they don't like wind, and they'll sit in the sun, usually in away from the wind, uh, and enjoy the evening uh, at being active, usually about two thirds up the tree, and just jumping from one branch to another. Uh, quite often they're gregarious, and they're occurring in quite large numbers, um, and occasionally you'll see some amazing sights when they all congregate in a, in a mating swarm and literally a ball of butterflies will go flying up into the air um, and then explode spontaneously into dozens of, of, of adults and come sharing back down to the tree. The white letter hair streak likes elm trees and that's where you commonly see it. And um, elm trees are very rare these days. And the best way to, to find an elm tree is now by looking on the ground for the, the Samaras, which the, the tree drops its fruit around about this time of the year through uh, May. And you'll see them on the ground, very easy to see. And the butterfly is only interested in, in fruiting, fruiting trees because its caterpillar feeds on the fruit. Now, the other two I've put in because there are rarest species. So I mentioned the Duke and Burgundy, which has just emerged today and occupies some very special sites. It needs very thin soils, uh, limestone usually um, in, uh, uh, the, there's only one place which you can see it in Yorkshire, um, which has access, and that's Hornby, Hornby Hill, which is near Hornby obviously. And this chap here, another beautiful insect called a pro board fertility. Uh, will become active in a few days time. You'll be able to see that on the North York Moors. So we want to attract more butterflies into our gardens. There's lots of ways we can do that. We mentioned nectar. Nectar is a big draw for, for butterflies. And there's lots of species and we've mentioned a few. Budley, of course, is one of them. There's lots of others, lavender, marjoram, daisy family, very good. Ivy for the autumn. A lot of species will, will feed up 
in the latter part of the year, like red admirals in particular, comma, will feed up on ap apple. And you're looking to plant plants which are all year round nectar. As well as wild wilding your mind, wild your garden. Leave part of your lawn uncut till later in the year. If you can get it, let it go to August. Or if your lawn has been fertilized, as mine had been, and demossed, it won't be suitable. So I've actually dug it up and sown a meadow. And you then can control uh, what species of plant you grow, what flowers, etc. If you've got a partner who expects everything to be a, a wonderful shape, shape, lots and lots of flowers, then put in some annuals in there to keep keep them uh, happy. As my wife said, well, it, uh, you only get white flowers, Nick. Why, why can't we have other colors? And I try to explain. Um, and let's go wild, except untidy is really just a state of mind. Now, don't only think about the, uh, the adults. What about feeding the caterpillars? And I mentioned a couple. So alder buckthorn is a really good one. I've actually been out in the garden this afternoon to look at my alder buck buckthorn. I planted uh, five a couple of years ago. They're only very small bushes, just very inconspicuous, but they're the food of the brimstone. And the brimstone's problem is it can't find enough food. And one of the reasons it's been slow to spread north is availability of food. And that's something we can really do. If we put some buckthorn plants into our gardens, brimstones invariably turn up. Now, I haven't seen a, uh, a brimstone in my garden this year, but I went and counted the eggs on my plants this afternoon. And I have five plants and there's eggs on all five and I counted about 50 eggs. Now, very few of those will make it through, but it just shows you ha what happens. Just a few plants can make a big difference. And of course, the, the, the orange tips are around at the moment and garlic mustard is a real big draw for them. That's a food plant. Metamorphosis, big, big name, but it's something that's taught to children now in, in year, year six and year seven. And it's, it, it really is a big draw for kids to find eggs, raise them to caterpillars, uh, learn about nature and watch them hatch from a chrysalis. It can be, a, 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 um, uh, for me, it was certainly a key point in my uh, childhood. I was given a little box of eggs by my teacher and raised them through to become emperor moths. And I repeated it this year and raised my own um, emperors and they hatched a few days ago. And um, I have one to release and skip with common uh, tomorrow. Moth trapping, let's not forget moth trapping. Now there's 10 times as many moths in your garden, nearly 400 species, um, all waiting there to be discovered. And there's such a huge variety of size and color. They're not all little brown jobs that buzz around your, buzz around your, your, your head. I mean, there are some really glorious ones. Um, it's, it's also a highly addictive uh, um, pastime. It's very rewarding and a great way to discover. And I find you find nearly a new species every time you put your trap out you're highly likely to find a new species that night. It's a great way to discover. And then we move on out of the garden. Let's, let's go out and about. When we're out of the bout and we're looking for butterflies, take note of any areas of uncut grass, the taller herbs, this is where they survive. They hate the mower. If there's one huge thing we could do for butterflies is just park the mowing machine throughout May, if you could. Um, and lots of our grass, grass and species that we've covered would really benefit from that. Um, but where to look? Well, things like brambles are a big magnet for, for butterflies. Valerian, uh, usually growing out of walls and dry places. Hemp agrimony, that uh, tends to be on the edge of woodlands. Knapweed, very classic. Uh, blue flower in uh, grassland, 
of course, everybody knows the Oxide Daisy. And the place to go and look quite often, south facing slopes, which warm, that, warm up that bit earlier. When we're out about, try and identify the tree, trees. And I mentioned about the elms and the white letter hair streets. It's easy to identify them now in April and then be ready in July when the butterfly emerges. And the same with the oaks, looking for a nice prominent oak in a hedgerow on the edge of a wood is, is the perfect place for, to see purple hedge, hair streaks. Try and take in some woodland while you're doing your walk, especially the, the wider flowery rides. They need light, obviously for flowers, that's the limiting factor of seeing butterflies in woodlands, but they really are rich places for butterflies if the woodland is right. And what's happened to our meadows has happened to our woodlands. So around about probably 90% of our woodlands are very badly managed. They don't have the wide, flower, wide flowery rides. And as a result, they're not much better than the agricultural fields around them. The life has been exterminated from them. As you pass the nettle patches, check, check those, check for caterpillar webs of our venesid species, the tortoise shells. The peacocks are highly uh, uh, get, you know, congregate together in a web. And if you're ambitious, have a look on our website for one of our butterfly walks. We have a map on the website that has uh, leaflets that you can download for lots of walks in really good butterfly sites. So we're going to look now at some of the tools we have. But before that, we're just going to ask Catherine, would you like to just give us a summary? Now I finished my formal part of my presentation and I get a bit of a rest. Yeah, I looked at the questions and how people have answered them. By far the question that people most want to be answered is where are the best places to look in Yorkshire? And the second choice of question was, I would like to know more about my area and the habitats that are close to me and what I might see. So people are really looking to know where they can see particular butterflies, I, I think, and the areas and the habitats. And what's so, around them. Yes. And when it comes to areas, actually, the, the majority of people come from Scarborough tonight. So oh. we've got a lot of people from Scarborough and we've got a lot of people from Leeds. But we've also got Beverley, Selby, Derby, Huddersfield, Ripon, Wakefield, Durham, uh, Guiseley near Leeds. OK. So, all sorts of different places, but Scarborough seems to be winning. Okay. Well, in that case, we'll do the as as when we get to the workshop, we'll do we'll do the tabular hills because it is a really rich area. Okay. So I'm going to move on now to our uh, tutorial section, and we're going to start by looking at the website, and I'm going to take you to the. This is the branch website for which I am responsible. I'm the guilty party. And I'll just show you where everything you need to know lives. So this is the guide here. And what we're gonna look at uh, first is when, when species first appear. And that happens here, it's called first sightings. There's a little spreadsheet we get, and this has all the species here. And if it's been spotted, you'll see the date here and the date it was spotted. And of course, to give credit to the people, we also put the names and where they've been seen. So the highlight one today is the 26th of April, Hornby Hill, which we mentioned, the Duke and Birdie are very rare species in Yorkshire that have been seen first time today. It's a good place just to pop to and see what's what's appeared. So I go back to here and now we're going to move to our sighting system. So this is our sighting system and you see here a table and as you put sightings in, which we're going to cover in a second through this button here called report, then sightings appear instantly here. So you can see the sightings today. 
Uh, we've had nearly 500 sightings so far this year. Uh, haven't, I can't believe how successful this system has been. Um, and um, really pleased. If you click one of the picture boxes, then up pops the picture. Um, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, and there's some really gorgeous, gorgeous pictures in here. And uh, Jessica Bone has photographed. I mean, there's some phenomenal photographs coming in at the moment. Uh, it's worth it just for that. But that's the, the job in job in hand, and that is to find out what's going on. So that's the system, and we can present it in uh, a different way. Um, we can click here and actually make everything appear on a map and press update and we get a map so there you begin to see where all the sightings have come from and as um, Catherine has pointed out there's a huge there seems a lot of us in Scarborough must be butterfly mad in Scarborough and in Leeds and to the west near Selby we have another big congregation Thank you, thank you very much for contributing. If only the same was true of South Yorkshire here where the big conurbations, we don't have any reports. We are failing to reach those people. So I hope more people will join from that area. Nick, we've got a question. Yes. Uh, is the sightings page to be used in preference to iRecord? They both end up in the same place. If you value what, what you're seeing tonight, use us. I think what we have to offer is a much more local picture, um, which enables people to see what's happening around them rather than I record, which is basically nationwide. Uh, you can get some of this kind of stuff on I record, but it's nowhere near as easy, one, to fill in a report, and two, to visualize what's going on. So I'll just, carry on and just show you some more of the things it can do so i'm going to make a i'm going to do a quick report just to show you how easy it is and it's actually easier than i record so this is the sheet you have so i just click in here and it remembers my name so no typing so far it immediately puts the pointer to the town that i say i'm from i can then put in the site name. So I've been to maybe Bishop Wood today, my favorite place. And I select a species. So let's have a, uh, let's have a Duke and Burgundy. I'm being very ambitious and only one. And let's just move the pointer now. I just drop the pointer in Bishop Wood, which is just there and I can precisely adjust it to exactly, I'm going to put it on the log pile. Anybody from Selby will know where I mean. There's the log pile. And all I need to do now is submit, press the button, submit the sighting. And that's a scientific record. Um, not only does it appear on the website so everybody can see, it can include a picture, but it also goes into official records. And more importantly, it goes to our county recorders so it can be verified. So if you made an error, error, they will get back in contact with you and just clarify what you saw. So that's how easy it is. Let's go back to sightings and let's just explore the other things it can do. So we can just, we can go up and down here. It goes on for a very long time. Um, but we can summarize it in different visualizations. So here's a, a visualization which you might find interesting, particularly if you're setting out to discover butterflies. This shows you all the species in the order which they occurred this year. So you can see the peacock was first, and the tortoiseshell was second, and the brimstone third. And the colors are according to numbers. So that's count one. But you can see here the bright colors, the bright pink, count of 35. So these are all the records coming in into the system, um, summarized in a very simple sheet. But more importantly, you get to see when, it, when species reach their peak. 
in another it's called a actually called a phenogram uh, and it actually plots the peak of emergence and as you can probably say the small tort tortoiseshell has actually gone past its peak while most other spe species have not quite reached their peak yet although i think the brimstone soon will be and the peacocks will soon be decreasing other species are still building up particularly the whites like the orange tips which you see we're getting up to 25. So that's a very handy feature. You get a very quick impression of what's going on, where we, where we are um, in, in, the, uh, in the year. So let's return and just go a little bit closer into more advanced features. So here we have the advanced selector. So we're moving the number of tools we have available now increases quite dramatically. So we still have the same table, but we have all these new boxes where we can look at different things. So we can select sites, we can select uh, different recorders, you see all these different names. We can select species. Somebody needs to turn their mute on. Okay. We can select species. So let's let's have a look at something less common. Let's look at green hair streak, uh, which had just emerged. And let's update. So now we see all the rec records of green hair streaks. It's, it's an uncommon, quite scarce species. And we're very lucky we're getting quite a few records coming in. And we can also put this on a map as we did before and up, press update. So you press update after each time. So if you're looking for a species, you want to know where, that is probably the best place to go. And it picks out various places. So for example, if you click one of these markers, it tells you where it, where that sighting was made. So this is Green Hair Street, we've got the picture. And Otley Chevin is a famous place for a Green Hair Street. And another famous place, probably is here, which is Brightstones in the Tabular Hills, but also Reesty Bank Top, um, overlooking, uh, looking out to see uh, the top of the moors. And uh, we also got one up on the, uh, at the other edge, uh, Cobbeck, um, Green Hair Streaks. It gives you an idea of some of the tools that it can, it, it can, uh, display our data. There's another, another thing we can do here, and that is se se select a, a location and then a diameter of a circle. So if you want to know what's happening in your particular area, you can select that and then select the diameter of the circle that you want to, to look around and press update. And it'll actually show you, show you a particular species or group of species. Uh, in that area. Uh, we also can select by vice county, uh, or we can draw a rectangle from two grid references. So it's a very powerful facility. Uh, we can also look at different months and we can look at the whole year up till now. So you get a whole year's data or you get a month data like so. Okay. Let's move on to one of those key questions that they asked you, you summarized, Catherine, and that's where are the best places? Well, we do have a map. Oh, I must point out Facebook, another really valuable source of information. And you'll see here today a picture of the, as the same as came into our sighting page, that first picture of the uh, Duke and Burgundy butterfly. This, this, this is a, a, probably one of the best places to see what's going on at any particular time. Um, lots of lovely photos. But the big problem with it is, although it's a, a wonderful community where people chat and talk about things, it doesn't turn our records into science 
these are lost records. Unless they go through a system like ours, they, they are lost, which is a pity. So if you post on Facebook, please post to us as well. Okay, moving on. Hope you can see this map. Now there's various color, colored shaded areas and they represent uh, what's important to butterflies is quite often ge geological areas. And you see here colored in different colors, different geological areas of Yorkshire. So the blue is the Humber Head. So this is the wetlands, uh, the wetter bits, the bits that flood. Uh, it has some wonderful, wonderful places within it, um, like uh, Thorn Moors, uh, Hatfield Moors, uh, Bishop Wood, which I live close to Bishop Wood, a wonderful forest, and the biggest, the biggest forest, one of the biggest forests in the Vale of York. Uh, this was once a dirty great big lake, um, but you can see uh, the, there's a large number of sites, and each of these butterfly symbols, if we click them, then um, you'll see the name of the site pop up um, and it gives you some details of what happens there. So this is um, Barlow Commons old railway yards, it's actually an old dump. Um, there's lots of scrub, woodland, meadows, and you'll see common blue, purple hair streaks, small heath butterflies. Uh, it's a very nice site actually. Um, and we have a official transect where um, walkers from Yorkshire Wildlife walk it every week as I do. Uh, Bishop Wood. Um, let's choose another site, shall we? Um, let's move on to the next big geological area, which is the pink, which is the, the limestone um, grasslands, mostly grasslands. And I guess the most famous is is the Yorkshire Wolds. Lots of lovely sites. Let's let's pick a few out. Um, uh, lots of dry valleys, uh, Friday Thorpe, Holmdale. Uh, Waterdale, lots of them. I've tried to put as much detail as we have into each of these. Now we have the Atlas, of course, we'll be able to put more details in. Uh, Thixendale, which is where I saw my first Yorkshire marble white, I uh, did feel, coming from Wiltshire, as you can tell, I did really, it was the first time I really felt at home is when I saw a marble white flying in Thixendale. One of the most famous sites in, in, in the world's uh, and probably one of the, the one of the richest is uh, let's have a look. No, if I can get the right one, uh, that one is Ford and Chalk, Chalk Banks, where the dingy skipper has just come out. It's a very quite uncommon species, uh, and this is one of its one of its better sites. And it's also uh, monitored and managed by uh, Yorkshire. Butterfly conservation. I guess the other most famous area for limestone grassland is the tabular hills, and it's kind of divided into two chunks. So there's one around um, Helmsley uh, and the other from Pickering over to Scarborough. And there places like Newtondale have long been some of the richest butterfly sites in Yorkshire. So over here we have the Duke of Burgundy um, living on uh, Hornby Hill. And uh, over this way, uh, we have uh, Appleton Common um, near um, uh, uh, Kirby Moorside, which is home for the pearl bordered fritillary, which is, those are the two rarest species in Yorkshire. You also got the Cleveland Hills along the top and the coastal strip, again, very rich in species. And let's not forget some of the wonderful places um, on, the, on the Dales. So Ingleborough and the surrounding area is very rich and a, butter, and a butterfly conservation landscape priority area. And we have one of our own only member of staff works in this area. But then we've got the Grassington area and Bastow Woods uh, where there's another rare species, the northern brown argus occurs, sometimes in very large numbers um, in, um, in Bastow Woods. Um, then the other big strip, you see this big long strip that kind of connects north to south. This is the magnesium limestone strip. 
and it's probably one of the richest butterfly areas. And you'll notice it's in blobs all the way down. It's kind of a, a, a big, dense series of blobs um, in, in places. Now that's a good, there's a good reason for that. Now, this is where the big rivers of Yorkshire, the major rivers, burst through the magnesium limestone ridge into the Vale of York. Where those rivers are burst through, there's quite often a gorge. Where there's a gorge, you've got very steep slopes, it's rocky, and the limestone's exposed. And as a result, there's lots and lots of beautiful grasslands with rare species. Uh, places like um, Marfield, uh, Nosterfield, cracking site on the magnesium limestone, 24 species of butterfly, lots of a fairly lengthy description because it's well mon monitored site. And I think uh, uh, Jill, Jill Warwick might be with us tonight. Um, the other important sites are the the valleys, the river valleys, and they're they're coloured brown because so many of these sites are brownfield sites, and where those brownfields uh, have occurred, obviously uh, as the coal industry and the heavy industry of Yorkshire has disappeared, as it's been exported to China, because um, we don't want to burn the carbon, but they apparently do. Um, we have all this wasteland and where there's wasteland, it's very poor soils. The grasses that grow are very thin and they're absolutely perfect for butterflies to colonize. And there's some, as you can see here, the Dern Valley is absolutely covered in rich brownfield sites, but we don't get any records from there. And we really ought to have good records. So lots of cracking sites. It's a good place to start. If you're just looking for good sites, it's a good place to look. There's 300 sites here. And you can select them here, interesting site, and it'll pop up where it is and a description. Some of them have maps, some of them have leaflets, which you can download. Uh, it's very far from complete. It's a massive job to get this done. It will be my priority. Uh, to update um, as soon as I'm able to. So that's the site page. Um, let's move on to another way of looking at sites. Now, you might not have seen this, and we're going to move over to the Tabular Hills because the request from Catherine was for looking at the Catherine at the uh, at the uh, Tabular Hills, and just look what this this is. This is debt from Defra, and we're going to look at some of the sites very briefly. And what what magic does is it's basically a, it looks at the land, and it can display all kinds of things. So if we look at access, we'll just remove this. Yellow is open access land. And as you know, this is the National Park. Most, a lot of the land is open access. In other words, we can walk on it. Let's just, just take it out so we can see what's behind it. So here we were talking about Newtondale and how rich it is. And it's largely because it is a, a site of special scientific interest. Um, and there's some cracking, you know, it is a gorge. And of course you've got all those rocky sites um, and some cracking species occur there. Um, I know, um, I don't know if John Hogg is here today. John Hogg came up with, with an idea of a challenge for any serious butterfly person. And that is a challenge to go from the, a walk through uh, North Yorkshire moors. How many species could you count in one day? And we reckoned that it would be possible you could get maybe the first week of July in this area, 30 species of butterflies, um, which would be an amazing achievement. He hasn't managed it yet. I think he got to 28 in, on his bike. Um, 
Now, what you can see here, these hatched areas are sites of special scientific interest, but there's lots of other stuff that we're looking at here. And the one particular one of interest is our grasslands. And let's just zoom in, say, on Appleton the Moors, the home of the pearl bordered fritillary. And just have a look here. So you can see, you see the map changes as I zoom in and you get much more detail. Now the purple means it, it's uh, unimproved grassland. Now it's always a positive uh, for butterflies. And it's also an SSSI. So you begin to feel some of the power of this program. It's basically by selecting different things over here. So the purple is uh, good quality, semi-improved grassland. Um, but also selected are things like um, other. So we can also look at open mosaic and that there, you just saw that one pop up there. They're quite often old quarries and the like, and they're worth exploring to discover what, what's, what's living there, what species are occurring there. This is a really powerful tool that you can use for discovering uh, what is in your area, which I think was what Catherine said, uh, what goes on in my area? And I must admit, I've used this on, on uh, where I live and discovered all kinds of amazing places to go and check out. And that's what we want you to do. Um, and this is a really powerful tool to give you a picture of an area. Um, the SSSI is usually a clue that you're in a good area, but then you can pick out particular habitats like the grasslands. Okay, so we can also superimpose soils. So if we can look for limestone soils um, and lots of other things. Let's move on to the next, if I can find it. Let's look now very briefly at the Atlas. So this is something Martin's worked, ex Martin Partridge worked extensively on um, in the last few months. It's a, it really is a joy to use. Uh, first of its kind, we think, and it's an interactive butterfly atlas. So what you're looking at here is the green hair streak. So a relatively um, uh, uh, scarce butterfly where it actually occurs in Yorkshire. So as you can see, in the lowlands, there's very little, but as soon as you get up onto the moors, there's loads and loads. And the redder the color, the more that there are. And this is from 20 years records and covers the whole of Yorkshire. So if you lived in Scarborough, then we can go and have a look what's happening in Scarborough. So there's a, a red spot, Thornton the Dale, Napgate. And we can also do Broxa Forest and also Brown Rig. And we can come across, and you notice that I'm, as I'm clicking, it's not only giving me the numbers, um, it's also giving me the, the site name. So these are one kilometer squares, but actually it gives you more than just a, the details of the square. It's giving you a site name. So you can go over here, and Hornby Hill, famous for green hair streak, seen 120. Um, it gives you an idea of the power of the Atlas and what it can do. Strensel Common is another good place to see them um, near York. Uh, for all those people who live in Selby, that's nice and easy to get to. Um, it's in the Yorkshire wildlife area. So the access is relatively easy. Um, and also over here, uh, around Otley, Otley Chevin is another easy place from the popular area of York, Yorkshire. That's one of the best places to see um, uh, a thousand uh, green hair streaks recorded there. Okay.
let's go back a second and uh, that's the end of the tutorial section and we're going to just move now to the um, workshop. So Catherine asked me to look more precisely at uh, the Scarborough area, uh, which really is the Tabla Hills. Now this is the limestone edge of the North York Moors. As you go higher, uh, where there's less uh, rivers have not cut through, then the limestone is not exposed. And most of the top of the moors is, of course, moorland, as you know. But the interesting places are uh, the ruts from uh, you know, the, the, the rivers. And uh, we can explore a lot more than just uh, from the atlas. We can explore, explore more than just one species. We can actually look at richness. So how many species in any particular square? So I hope that will update. Yes, it does. So I'm just going to click all VCs. Well, I don't have to, I can, and then we'll zoom in. And you begin to see, this is some of the richest areas in Yorkshire. And we'll use the red. I know some of you might be colorblind, but I find it much easier to use the, the, the heat of red um, to see, see what's going on. And you begin to see where there's a deeper color, that's where there's more species. If you click one of those squares, it shows you all the different species in that particular square and how many. So when you get to 29, that's a lot of species for one location in, in, uh, in Yorkshire. That's a heck of a lot of species of very few squares with that. And that's Newtondale. And there's a number of them along Newtondale with that's with 30. That has to probably be one of the richest squares in, in Yorkshire. And let's have a look at this one here. So this is Deepdale. Now this is an interesting location because it's where uh, uh, where our, the very earliest formal recording was done um, by Peter Robinson back in the, the very early 70s. The first formal records of butterflies were made in Yorkshire. And the other location, of course, is the Kirby Moorside, just, just to the, the uh, east of Kirby Moorside, another rich area, Appleton Moor. And of course, uh, we have Hornby Hill, uh, 25 species a butterfly and famous for the Duke of Burgundy. So that's one way of looking at an area. Um, and we can narrow that down by looking at different species that we've al already looked at. But we can also use, as we've, that we've uh, been looking at, we can also use magic to look at an area. So again, we're looking here at uh, Newtondale and the surrounding area. And we can zoom in on Newtondale and see all the different sites, the different names of the places. Look at the, the different grassland areas, etc. Or we can look at it from the point of view of the sites. So we can look at the uh, key sites. If I can find my button, here we go. So we're going to look at this bit. So this is Newtondale here. Gundale. Uh, we have work parties go to Gundale. And one, probably one of, the, one of the best sites to see butterflies in, in Newtondale is probably um, Yats Farm. Again, it, it's one of Yorkshire Butterfly uh, Conservation's uh, sites that we, we, we manage. Um, we've done uh, a lot of work there. Uh, Duke of Burgundy appeared uh, for the first time a couple of years ago. And this is an area we're really trying to bring the Duke of Burgundy butterfly 
back to with some success. It's beginning to happen. This year will be a good test. And you'll begin to see other sites, uh, Paxton Bank, Elebrim Bank, famous for its butterflies, another cracking site to go to. The very first site that I ever went to uh, to really see butterflies in Yorkshire. Um, it's a Yorkshire wildlife and uh, has things like the uh, dark green fertility, the dingy skipper, uh, quite a rare species. And uh, this area here is also, also uh, Dimbleby Potts is famous for its green heart hair streak. Um, Turkey carpet, what a funny name. Um, the silver wash fertility appeared there in, in quite large numbers in 2019. The other way to, to look, look and hunt for things is to look at the ordnance survey. So let's just go to where we've been looking and have a look on the ordnance survey. Just look at the th kind of things we can do with it. Um, let's go back to Newtondale. Now, the fact that you've got a yellow outline here means it's open access land, which is a, a good sign. Um, and there we see um, uh, Elebrim Bank just in here. Hexton Moor, another cracking site for fritillaries, the dark green fritillary. And then just a little bit further over at Pickering, we have Gundale and Yats Farm is just there. And it's this valley here. It's a footpath um, that you can walk down. So it is private land, it is farmed, but there is an foot, official footpath that you can follow. And similarly over to Gundale, there is an official footpath you can follow. Please don't trespass. Um, please check before you go somewhere that, that, that it does have access. And it's sites like this, like the Ordnance Survey, will give you lots of clues, as does magic with the, uh, the open access land. Just check you're going, going to be legal wherever you're going. So that's my um, um, workshop. We've worked through basically a little part of the Tabula Hills. Um, and I think I'm around about ready to open it up to questions, Catherine. So. Yes, could you explain a bit about, about ticks and what you spray on to get rid of them or to get, you know, to put them off? Okay. <laughs> quite important because yeah. I got Lyme disease last year. So this Ooh. is quite important. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, DEET is a really bitter, uh, bitter substance. Uh, basically, they're much less likely to bite you and drop off. The, the, the real problem is if it's warm, like, you know, 20, 20 degrees plus, ticks get, get up onto long grass. And of course, when we're searching and for butterflies, quite often we're wading through bracken and, and long grasses. And it is inevitable that you do pick up ticks. I remember in a bad tick year, 2019, uh, I think I got one every time I went to Bishop Wood. Um, there's a lot of deer, of course, the deer ticks that we're talking about. There's a lot of deer around. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, deer numbers have, 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 have multiplied dramatically um, because not normal control is, is not being done. Um, and tick is on the rise. And Lyme disease, which you mentioned, goes with it. So be aware of the symptoms of Lyme disease. So first, the most important thing is spray yourself with DEET. You can get it as a little aer aerosol, spray it on. I put it on the, uh, roll, your, roll your trousers up, and spray it on your bare part up to your, up to your knees. That will do a lot to protect, protect you. And that's how they get in. Um, and then when you get home and you have a shower, just inspect particularly inside top of your legs is you know those big big blood vessels they're after to they're after a meal um, and that's quite often where they head to inspect yourself even that tiny black spot you think oh that's just a little tiny little 
microscopic and you rub it and think, is that me or is it something else? And you're not quite sure. Be concerned. It, if it's a little black dot, it's most likely a tick. And there are tools to get ticks off. I find it because I've got good nails, it's relatively easy to use. Use two fingers and um, uh, just pinch them around the base of the tick and just and you hit the reason they're called tick of course is when they when you pull them off they go tick um, as their jaws uh, relax uh, as you pull them off um, it's a, a, a literally a, a like clockwork you know the, the jaws unlock and you get the tick um, normally it takes 24 hours before you get infected with limes um, so you've got good day to have a shower inspect yourself carefully and get rid of them um, if you don't and you and you see after three or four days a red ring around where the tick has infected you have Lyme's disease and that's a serious condition I know one of my gamekeeper friends um, his wife has had it it's, it is a deadly serious disease and you need to go to the doctor and get it treated for, with antibiotics. It is treatable, but only treatable if you catch it within those first few days. So it's nothing to panic about. It doesn't worry me anymore. It's relatively easy to get rid of them. You just need to take the right precautions, spray the DEET and check yourself when you wash that night or the next morning. So you've got 24 hours or so to make sure you got rid of them. Yeah, because the antibiotics are horrible. So it's yeah. best to check so you don't actually need the antibiotics, I've found. Okay, Catherine. No, you're very okay. queasy. Right, so the next question is, why do you think, if I go back to the question, um, why do you think there's so few sightings being recorded on the sightings page from South Yorkshire? It's a really good question. I wish I knew the answer. Somehow we're not reaching that area, and I'm not sure why. Um, they are obviously have their own active groups, as there are active groups in in the Scarborough area um, and other areas. It seems they 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 uh, are uh, fine on their own. They don't feel the need to to join the rest of Yorkshire. But then you look at the history of South Yorkshire. That's that's um, been a bit of a factor, I think. But we do seem to have lots and lots of people from from the Leeds area. And I guess what I'm hoping for is uh, what we're creating will be contagious and will spread to South Yorkshire uh, eventually. I've made it my task uh, on the committee to find out why and try and build bridges with those communities. So I've been in contact with people like Sorby, which is a Sheffield area uh natural history group who have their own butterfly recorder um and we need to build those bridges and try and bring them into the fold um there's lots of wonderful sites down there uh i took some visits last year um because we're, we're very interested to see new species crossing into south yorkshire south yorkshire is where it's all going to happen uh where these new species are going to appear um, we're, the one that of particular interest is the purple emperor um, butterfly, which is an enigmatic uh, species uh, that obsesses lots and lots of people. Um, and uh, it's, it has been um, seen in Yorkshire, odd ones. Um, and one of the sites in particular is Maltby Low Common, a beautiful site, lots and lots of sallow bushes, which is a food plant for the purple emperor. And um, I think we really hope that we can improve the uh, uh, reporting because then we can be able to see these species moving in. Next question. Please could you tell us how to access the transect information on Google Maps? Uh, what do they mean by information, do you think, Catherine? Perhaps the transect leaflet okay. type things, yeah. Okay, um, there's lots and lots of places you can look at our transects. So if you go to the website and go to recording and go to uh, transects, it gives you a lot of information on becoming a transect walker, why we record, what happens to our data, 
the importance of it. And it also gives you a map like the one that we were just looking at. And on that, you'll find all the transects. Um, right. And, and the other one, here's a list. So these are a list of all the sites. So we have about uh, 60 sites currently. Um, I'll show you the status, but also you can also look here at the transect reports. So you, here you'll see all the names. So if we go to uh, my transect, which is uh, Bishop Wood, you'll see here a map of the transect, details of it, what's been seen, all the different sections, what a report on last year, and you also see all the trends here. So the years it's been monitored, we're looking here at the trends in different species. There's an awful lot of data on the website. If you want to know about uh, a special place like Bishop Wood is a very special ancient woodland. Okay, next question. Are there likely to be any public openings of moth traps this summer? Oh, uh, we're trying. Um, it is my next uh, thing is to uh, to do some um, online mothing sessions uh, with Terry Crawford because um, our objective is to create a, a moth academy. So every two weeks we have a evening session and open a moth trap and actually uh, inspect the species that we're getting at that time and then work through the identifying features of species. So the only thing that's stopping us at the moment is time, um, but uh, moths at the moment are going through a lull because the early ones have just about finished. So we've got time to get our act together ready for the main season, which starts in around the middle of May. That's when moths really kick off big style uh, with hundreds of species. So we want to be ready for that time. So watch this space. Next question. Any tips on spotting butterflies at rest, such as earlier in the morning? Ooh. Yeah. Uh, I think you have to know where they are, really, don't you? And yeah, I mean, look for them there. Butterflies do congregate. They're, they're interesting creatures um, and they will congregate to roost. I think that's what we're talking about, roosting butterflies. Where do they roost? Um, well, the blue butterflies will actually roost, roost in a, a communal roost. And that's quite often at the bottom of the slope. Uh, and they'll, they'll gather in some numbers. If you're very lucky, you'll find those roosts. Um, but in general, it's tricky. Once they go inactive, of course, they want to hide away. They don't want to be seen by birds, they're main predators. They really want to be as invisible as they can be. So catching roosting butterflies is a tricky one. And they're well camouflaged. When you look at uh, the butterfly's top side and particularly underside, it's all about camouflage. How do I make myself invisible while I'm resting? Uh, and some of the dark undersides, like the ones that hibernate, invariably have black unders undersides in order to make themselves invisible. Um, and we could spend a whole evening talking about um, mimicry and how butterflies go about um, disguising themselves as different things or uh, how to dis distract birds from damaging important parts of an insect's bodies. So the use of eye spots and things like that um, to distract their enemies away from their vital organs. Next question, please, Catherine. Is there any system to track individual butterflies similar to migrating birds? No, it's a huge, huge gap in our knowledge. Um, we, the, the, the simple truth is we do not really know how long butterflies live. We do not really know how far they travel um, or where they, in, you know, how they travel at different times of the year. Um, what, we, what we do have is upward pointing radar and uh, this is used to track the, uh, the uh, 
painted lady butterfly. Um, and it's based at Rothamsted, the research station at Rothamsted. They have an upward pointing radar and they can tune it to different size creatures which fly through the beam above the radar. And they can pick out birds from butterflies and even different size butterflies. And uh, they could actually see the numbers of migrating painted ladies and actually calculate roughly how many arrive. But more interestingly, as we normally see butterflies as they arrive, but the Rothamsted radar actually spots them during the night because they migrate during the night, but they're leaving us, not coming to us. So we're not always aware of it. So 20 million, I think something like 20 or 40 million painted ladies arrived in 2019, but nearly double that left in the uh, latter part of, of summer. So nearly double the number went south in the autumn, but they travel at night. And of course, the only way to see them is with radar. Some work's been done with just attaching a little um, uh, radio tracker onto uh, the thorax, the, 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 the body of the butterfly. It's a little, uh, uh, a little diode with, a, with an antenna, which will ring um, and retransmit uh, if, if, if it's uh, uh, illuminated by radar. The trouble is that the range is very short um, and you can only do it with a machine the size of a, a trailer. Um, so it has limited, limited what you can do. So it only has a range of about uh, 20 or 30 meters in woodland and maybe a few hundred meters in open space. But uh, I wish somebody would invent something because we could answer all kinds of questions about the uh, basic habits of our butterflies, i.e. how long do they live and uh, how far do they fly? Um, we could answer those critical questions. If you want to know more, then uh, that book, uh, the Butterfly Book, uh, is a cracking place to, to go and explore questions like this really cracking book. I'm halfway through it and reading it avidly. Next question. Could you give the author of that book again, please? Okay, it's Martin Warren. So he was the uh, ex uh, chief executive of uh, Butterfly Conservation England. Martin Warren. Right, the last question that we've got is, I have lots of mid late summer flowering plants, but what should I have in my garden to attract butterflies in April and May? That's a good question. And um, of course, it, it tends to be yellow is the dominant color uh, during the early part of the flowering season. And uh, also things like sallow, um, you know, goat willow, that's very attractive. It has a lot of nectar and is very attractive to the peacocks uh, during the early part. Um, and if you see it on a wooden walk, you quite often see peacocks. Dandelions, of course, very attractive. Uh, garlic mustard. So, um, but also things like um, wallflowers, perennial wallflowers uh, are good ones, or brucia, um, and other spring flowering, uh, particularly yellow is, is a favorite color for butterflies. Anything really that has nectar um, uh, and, and yellow in particular is highly attractive and we'll draw them in. Right, I think that's all the questions. Thank Excellent. you very much. Um, I'd just like to sum up, if that's possible. Thank you very much everybody for attending. As you've seen, our scarcer butterflies are very restricted to some really tiny pockets of surviving habitat. These pockets are very much more than a few butterflies. These steep slopes of brown grass, stony old mines, industrial sites, scruff, somewhat scruffy looking ancient woodland and forgotten old quarry work, workings really are Noah's arcs, not only of butterflies, but of all kinds of species, all kinds of invertebrates. Uh, they are the, literally the Noah, Noah's ark of biodiversity. Until we such times like the plan for 3030. Now that's 30% of the land is the target will be devoted to nature by 2030. That's the government target for biodiversity. And to feed that 
is a nature recovery network. And the, our sites will be critical in, in enabling those species. We're, we're the Noah, these sites are the Noah's Ark. And we have to remember that our young people do suffer uh, shifting, what's called shifting baseline um, syndrome. So not many of us will remember uh, the, snow, the moth snowstorms of when we were kids, when we're driving home late, late at night, and all you can see out the car is just a, a, literally a, a, a snowstorm of, of moss, or those bug splattered windscreens of, of, of the 70s and 80s. Um, and people are forgetting, and it's very easy to forget what it was, back, what it was like uh, back then. We've lost so much and um, we have to preserve what we've got left. The branch's objective is really to create an inventory. And you've seen the start of that with the 300 sites that we have so far. But I think, and with your help, there's a lot more we could discover. And if I can encourage you tonight to go out and look for those sites and use the tools that we've talked about tonight, that would be a major achievement. I think there's 600 or, or more sites waiting to be discovered. And if we, if those of you can then also be champions for those sites, so wa watch over them and see if anything's changing. Our enemies are manifold, but the two critical enemies are, if it's grassland, that's scrub ingress. And that's why we have work parties, is to control scrub ingressing onto good habitat. habitat. Um, something that's been there for 400 years can be wiped out in, in 10 because of scrub, scrub not being managed. So we're looking forward to, to finding time to get that invent, inventory clear. And I think it will be as, as important as the Atlas in guiding conservation will be our site inventory. So before you leave, can I ask you, can you put some ideas down in chat on any talks that you would like in the future? Um, maybe you would like to know more about migration, I feel, uh, courtship, um, or maybe a specific area. So for instance, you know, it could be the Sheffield and Rotherham area, perhaps we'll focus on that. Um, if you really want to learn about butterflies in more detail, I have to tell you, this is how I learned what I know is, is to join a conservation um, group on one of their work parties, because you get to meet lots and lots of people with the same interests as you. Please, please do get out and discover, enjoy it. And I look forward to all the sightings um, that, you, you, that you send in, into the website. And it's good night from me. Thank you very much for attending.